Hi, I'm Ena Malik Hussain and you're watching The Coffee Table and you know we love having conversations about the arts on the show and we do that a lot. But today we have a really interesting twist on the form and today we're going to be talking to, to two very, very talented photographers slash multidisciplinary artists about their work. So we're talking about photography today and fine art and how all of these sort of ideas come together, how things converge and you know everything about it. Since I'm a photography dunce, I'm going to leave it to them to tell us interesting things. So I'm very, very happy today to be welcoming on set with me, Nashmiya Haroon, who is a multidisciplinary artist. She's a photographer. She has a BFA in fine arts and a postgraduate degree in visual arts from the National College. And via Skype, joining us is Matt Cushion, who has a BFA in photography from the School of Visual, Visual Arts in New York City, an MFA in photography from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, and currently is an assistant professor in fine arts at the Beacon House National University. Hello, Hi, welcome Mina. to the show. It's so nice to see you in person. And hello, Matt, from far away across, you know, the internet. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited because photography is something that I am very interested in. And visually, I like looking at it. But it's also something that I don't really know technically much about, for example. And I think that sort of, maybe if we start from the beginning in a sense that photography wasn't always seen as art. Yes. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, Professor. That's a very interesting question because I think I've been answering or I've been trying to prove it <laughs> all my life. Uh, even as a painter, I mean, uh, photography was always there, even though I was doing a degree in painting yeah. in the undergrad. Hmm. Uh, but uh, I feel like uh, people disregard it very easily, although I think it's, mo it's the most common tool today. Yeah. For every possible medium uh, mm -hmm. of uh, communication. Yeah. So it's a very, <laughs> this is a very vast question that you're asking. And I, like <laughs> I said, I'm trying to just prove it. Yeah, we will yeah. unpack it slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but Matt, um, it's true, isn't it, that when photography first began in like the late 19th century, the daguerreotypes were sort of used as artists' aids because painters were then sort of taking photographs of things and then using them to actually then paint on canvas. Yeah, and I think photography has had a footing um, in um, both popular culture, amateur culture, professional culture, or art culture, even, mm. you know, from the beginning, like, late 19th century. Yeah. Uh, and it has evolved over time. And, you know, that question that you brought up before is that is, can photography be considering be considered art, I think is kind of an ongoing conversation that has been happening um, since photographers like, um, um, at, um, 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 I'm sorry, Alfred Stieglitz, yes. um, who started the 291 Gallery in New York, who was a pioneer of photography and was probably one of the first photographers to actually um, start uh, showing photography work in an actual gallery uh, mm. next to paintings. Because for that, it's not like really um, um, artists, um, or at least the art community at that time, were really considering photography um, as a medium. And I think it's still kind of funny that we live in this age now, and um, it, it, it's interesting because I think we all kind of consider ourselves a photographer. Yeah. Um, I think anyone with an Instagram account, it's very <laughs> accessible. I actually think that's a really wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, and it has gone many, 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 many places. Um, mm. and, 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 and I think that that's really, really um, interesting. Yeah, and that's something I want to circle to as well. But it's really interesting to sort of look at photography as a practice because I think that in the West, and again, I'm using the West as like a you know, sort of blanket term, like Matt said, um, in the sort of 60s and the 70s, there was this sort of idea and this movement for photography to be included in this sort of fine arts canon and to be shown in galleries and to sort of view it as art, you know, the capital A. But we don't really see that happening in Pakistan. Do we? Well, I think definitely there's uh, there's room for improvement yeah. there, and but I think slowly it's really getting there. Hmm. Um, there are a lot of uh, there are a couple of institutes that offer such programs also, and hmm. uh, a, a lo even if they're not, uh, even if the final artwork is not a photograph, it's 
derived or the the process has so so much of photography incorporated in that oh, so, well, that's interesting yeah. and because yeah. you are a multidisciplinary artist mm. yourself mm. then that is a sort of avenue so do would you say that photography does lend itself easily to other forms of creative expression absolutely it, it does and also i think uh, the art world completely changed when photography was invented mm. i mean it was um, it's seen as um, the surface was completely different i mean you know I'll, when the photographer when the camera was invented yeah. uh, the you know so many painters they they arrived at these compositions through yeah. uh, photography and that really changed a lot of things about perspective composition um that's very really interesting yeah. so what do you mean when you say surface surface change this uh i'm talking about composition mostly yeah. with the you know perspective one point two point perspective and you know uh basically there was a device uh that a german um you know scientist he used mm -hmm. uh called the camera obscura i yes. mean it was there before it's yeah. also called like a pinhole yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. camera but is that the, the one the, with the when you put that sort of thing over your head then uh, that big well box? no it's just it's <laughs> it's you can actually make a pinhole camera out of a broom even or yeah. or a very yeah. or a matchbox or even yeah. your mouth <laughs> because it shuts yes yes it's very interesting you can you should look <laughs> look that up um but uh basically the co camera obscura was a way to view um whatever composition the you know the uh, the sorry the artist yeah. wanted to look at so uh it kind of uh, composition onto the paper but the camera obscura does not did not allow to have like a film or a plate to uh -huh. have the image fixed on that so oh. they could just have it it was almost like think of like a projection Okay. So it was kind of the the view was huh. projected. Uh, the light would travel through the you know the glass medium and be projected yeah, yeah. onto the paper, and it was easy for painters to compose their work. Oh, okay. So I get it. It's so like a projection that came onto yeah. paper, and then you could maybe paint over that reflection yeah. or do whatever yeah. you wanted. Yeah, with yeah. It, as something like to... something like that. Hmm. Something hmm. like that. Yeah. But I'm really glad that you brought up this sort of the idea of printing an image onto like a glass plate or film because that's Matt where I want to ask you about how sort of photography and the way that do you think that the evolution of technology photographic technology also helps to sort of influence the way photography was seen as an artistic medium always yes i mean if you go back from the, to to the very beginning mm -hmm. um photography always very closely connected to technology and the mm -hmm. advancement of technology. Yeah. If we begin with um, how people, as uh, Nashmiya was saying about, you know, fixing photographs, because, you know, b yeah. before we, uh, you know, the camera has been around since like 1604, the camera obscura, what she was talking about, yeah. which was a painting aid. The, the uh. thing that really scientists, I guess, um, at the time really couldn't figure out was how to fix that image onto a sheet of paper. Mm. Um, now, uh, when people like William Fox Talbot or um, Nieps um, came up with their own methods um, through um, 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 mixing different kinds of chemicals and salts together um, mm -hmm. and applying that onto paper and thus making it light sensitive and then that light hitting the paper and then okay. it fixing onto that paper, um, 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 that kind of changed the face of our understanding, not only understanding of the world, but our uh, understanding of, 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 of maybe even how we exist ourselves in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And now if you shift right now where we are um, with, with cell phone cameras and Instagram, yeah. now photography coming kind of like this social thing um, and rather than sharing photographs like we used to in photo albums we're now exchanging um, photographs by the milliseconds yeah. kind of like um, we're exchanging currency and we're communicating mm. with pictures so the technology you know the photography if I can kind of wrap it up the photography is one of those things that is closely kind of dependent on the technology uh, um, 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 in which it kind of um, facilitates Right. And do you think initially because it was more complex and it was a sort of larger undertaking to be a sort of serious photographer, maybe that's a reason. Do you think that that's why interest in it was limited or do you think that it actually was sort of sparking this imagination because it kind of did show different ways and like Nashmi said, you know, the surface of things changed and you could look at light differently and you could you could sort of preserve things to look at later on and sort of that, that spirit of inquiry kind of changed. Mm -hmm. And also I think the the image would look started to look a lot realistic. 
Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So do you think More that that realistic. also influenced how then art composition? Absolutely, was? absolutely. That mm. photography changed a lot of these things about art. Absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. know the three dimensionality mm. of the image, a lot of things. So uh, Matt, sort of taking on from what Nashmi said about composition and how sort of uh, photography also helped people see things. And, and sort of compose images differently. Um, there was this also this idea that in the 70s, for example, uh, the idea of like a fine art photograph was landscape based. So you had, you know, people like Ansel Adams, or Cindy Sherman, taking pictures of, you know, Yosemite and trees and, you know, shrubs <laughs> and things like that. So it sort of began in a very traditional sense of a picture, but then it has evolved over time. Yeah, I think, you know, that question, it depends on who you're asking and it depends where you live. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. In the 70s in New York at the time, there's this guy, John Sarkowski, who actually directed the photography department at MoMA, who kind of chased, changed the face of photography and the way that we look at photography. Um, before him, uh, museums, first of all, really weren't collecting photography as a form of art. Um, and um, most of the photography work that was being shown in galleries at that time were much more, um, I guess you can say traditional in the way that the photographers were approaching art. Like you yeah. mentioned Ansel Adams, who does kind of very straight on landscape photography. It's very beautiful uh, and it's remarkable if you look at it, some really interesting scenes. Uh, but John Sarkowski came in and he was a little bit more interested in the whole, um, idea of amateurism in photography okay. um, and he brought in some photographs um, from photographers like Diane Arbus and Lee Freelander and this guy William Eggleston um, who were kind of looking at the banality of things in life you mm. know just kind of the ordinary everyday things that people or at least in the art community at that time really weren't um, looking at or really seeing as a high form of art mm. so yeah from the perspective of maybe being in New York um, at that time <laughs> Mm. Uh, that was in Pakistan during that time, something else was happening. Um, and the world was much more, I feel like, closed off then. Whereas mm. now I think, you know, it's crazy. Um, uh, I was just thinking the other day, I have this Zoom class and I have students from like all over Pakistan who were taking the Zoom class. And yeah. it's just like, we're all in the same room. And yeah. it's just like, uh, and it's just it's 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 just bizarre, and and that has really changed the face of the photo community as it is right now too. Um, mm. So you know, it it it's it's a complicated. I, I feel like there's no one straight answer I can give. It's yeah. kind of a complicated mess of a lot of. <laughs> we like complicated on the coffee table. We're going to take a very quick break and come back to this fascinating conversation. Stay with us. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to The Coffee Table. We're having a riveting conversation with artists Nashmi Harur and Matt Kushan about photography and how it's evolved and how we look at it as art. And it's great. I'm having a fabulous time. <laughs> so Nashmi, before we went to the break, Matt mentioned that, you know, at a certain time, like in the 70s and the 80s in New York, uh, you know, photography was developing a certain way and there was this sort of, you know, uh, modernism was happening and things were happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious that I think that in Pakistan, the photography sort of um, aspect of art or art making, I, I, we, we, we haven't, it hasn't been as rapid for us, mm -hmm. has it? Because I think like in the 80s, I don't think there was a lot of like art photography happening, for example. Uh, well, I think uh, because at the time there was no digital photography hadn't been invented yeah. at that time. So uh, pretty much, uh, you know, analog photography, large uh, film formats were mm. there. And, uh, you know, photography, as we know, uh, was a lot slower at that time. And Good old film because, I, I, because actually I've been very fortunate. Uh, I used to tell my students also that yeah. I've been very fortunate because I started from the analog yeah. business, yes. you know, and, uh, you know, there were only well, 36, there used to be those 36 yes. uh, photos in the 35mm yes. film roll. So, you know, for, for younger viewers, you know, back in the day, we had cameras with actual film in them. Yeah. And there used to be only 36. 36 in one roll. Little, you in know, photo slots. Yeah. And yeah. you didn't know what it looked like. You just yeah. took a picture and yeah. just, you know, crossed your fingers. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that photo format, uh, analog format was pretty high quality compared ah. to what you have in digital 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I won't go too much into the technical stuff. Little but bit what I'm trying, a little bit is fine. <laughs> so, I, I mean, for example, I used to have like these 36 images and yeah. I was, I had to be in total control. There was no LCD at the back of the camera. Mm. You know, there was mm. no screen at the back of the yeah. camera. And I could not, I ha just had to know from looking at where Minna is sitting. I had yes. to know what the light meter would say. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. had to just know it, you know. Huh. Um, F8 or F8. 5.6 and the speed would be this much I would just know it but now uh, um, you know with the digital camera uh, in fact in the beginning I remember when I got my first digital camera yeah, yeah. I actually put a paper <laughs> behind it and I said because I felt like I was cheating <laughs> with the analog camera yeah, like, and this is what is this is bizarre I can take a thousand pictures at the same time <laughs> and not worry about you know missing something or yeah. losing images and so so I think uh, that being starting with the analog mm, uh, photography mm, mm. really gave me the kind of confidence that I feel like a lot of kids uh, now I feel like anybody who's picking up picks up huh. the SLR camera first of all it's a very difficult thing for them because everybody is right. so used to pointing and shooting with their phones with their and phone, their yeah. other uh, you know mirrorless cameras and all huh. uh, so it's it's uh, it's something to look at because I, I definitely had technical control and I knew what my exposure would be like yeah but now I feel like a lot of the students when they come up they take like you know 500 images and out of those I probably can the, when the, when they pick it up for the first time you can just pick about 10 or 15 wow and that's uh, a massive great ones. amount of and, and uh, that's a lot wasting. of confusion in my yeah. and I think uh. that focus and that kind of discipline um, analog taught me was yeah. uh, really worthwhile right. yeah. and this is very interesting because both you have taught photography for years and Matt continues to do so so Matt what do you think about that do you think that um sort of the ease of photography now has kind of taken away in some ways the sort of depth of technique that is required. Yeah, it's funny, uh, Nashmi, you say you, you um, felt fortunate that uh, you grew up uh, alongside analog. I also grew up alongside analog and um, it was a blessing and a curse for sure. Um, I remember definitely having, you know, to wait a few days for my film to be processed and to come back and that really slowing me down. Hmm. Um, and now it feels like things are almost moving too fast. So, hmm. you know, back when, when I started in art school and I was actually shooting film and printing it out of myself in a dark room, I just felt like um, it was always kind of like this, this molasses that was slowing me down. And now it's just too quick. And as an educator and as a teacher, what I actually um, have had to shift now that everything um, is so quick and readily available and so accessible, because, you know, a lot of students, like I feel like when I went to photography school yeah. um, and I came into my photo class, um, I had already taken photography classes in my high school. I kind of had been to some museums and have seen, you know, Ansel Adams and, you know, Nan Golden and, and, and let's say like Cindy Sherman and these kind of photographers. So I kind of had this like uh, uh, um, visual vocabulary about yeah. what photography was supposed to be mm. and what was expected. And then midway through um, art school um, in the early 2000s, like a wrench was thrown in and then digital photography came in and then no one really knew what to do. Um, mm -hmm. Now we're in 2020 and I think in Lahore at least, I mean in Pakistan at least, everyone is using digital photography, which yes. is an interesting thing because actually in the West and in America, I have a lot of friends who are teaching at universities and in their curriculum, darkroom photography is still um, at the core of the foundation in their curriculum, ah. which I about and kind of I'm actually wondering if that's actually a good thing um, so you know when I'm in, um, teaching photography um, I mostly teach digital because that's what's available mm. um, you can't really buy photographic paper in the market here so that really? definitely changes mm. the understanding of photography huh. and I guess the way um, 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 that we approach it so actually when, 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 you know, I just, re I just finished a course recently. It was a two yeah. months intensive course called the Critical Lens Photographic mm -hmm. Approaches to Art Making. It was actually a part of the global class um, at Beacon House National University. And um, um, it was all online. It was all through Zoom chats. And so actually, I didn't actually physically meet any of them. So what I actually focused on, and again, you know, digital photography allows us to take lots of images. There's no restriction. Like Nashmi mm -hmm. was saying, you know, you used to have 
restriction of 36 frames. Yeah. And so each and every frame, you put a lot of thought and intention into it. Um, yeah. So now it's just click, 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 click. Here, teacher, look what I did. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so actually the core focus now has been um, getting people to think about all the, all the noise that they brought into the classroom and how to, to kind of make sense of that noise. Um, and that's what I'm seeing my, at least, the way I teach photography has changed a lot and shifted from before is that it's mm -hmm. a lot about kind of you know, figuring out what to do with all the noise. Yeah, that's interesting because I am also wondering about how, you know, the intentionality of it. So when we were working with analog, for example, then, and I think that that's a really important point, Matt, that you have to really sort of think about what you're putting into a frame and how you're going to sort of arrange it. And I think that this is also a point of divergence in different photographers' techniques also, where it's a sort of one stage is a photograph as opposed to just sort of taking a picture of what already exists. And Matt, I believe that you do like to kind of uh, stage your own work. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, in my own practice, um, definitely. I'm really, um, I'm really into the idea of staging, not just for the um, not just for the process, but what also it means to stage a photograph. I'm also really interested these days in my own practice and the idea um, of, 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 of truth in photography, which is a really mm. old topic to be thinking about, yeah. but kind of truth and idea, especially me living in Pakistan and mm. kind of coming into this world. Um, and of course, you know, coming in with preconceived notions about um, what this place is, what yeah. am I supposed to expect it to be? And then mm. also there's kind of that heavy burden on my shoulders about also bringing back home certain images that maybe are expected um, out of me to show the Western world of the, hmm. of the Eastern world. Yeah. There's always kind of like this duality of thinking um, where I'm kind of like caught between two worlds and expectations and preconceived notions and ideas about what I should be photographing and what I shouldn't be photographing. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, it's something that I've been very interested in, in lately um, um, that, that I've been working on. That's really interesting, like the idea of food. So, Anishma, what do you think about that? Because they're all, there's so many different kinds of representational... I mean, photography can take so many different sort of directions. Because, of course, mm. we have, for example, we have, you know, more documentary pho photography, like mm. what photojournalists do. Mm. Mm. And then we have more artistic photography. But then also, like, one sort of, as a layperson, one thinks of photograph as real, because you're sort of taking a, a picture of something that exists, and you've kind of... It, it, it's a very functional kind of idea of realism, but mm. you can also manufacture realism in a photograph, and that just sounds all kind of really interesting to me. So could you sort of, could you unpack it for me? Yes, <laughs> you know, uh, actually, flung it on you. <laughs> you know, actually, um, the, you know, if you if you allow, if you give uh, ten cameras to ten lay persons who yeah. know nothing about photography, the technique or anything, you put mm. it on auto, they, and you ask them to photograph uh, a still life. They will all photograph it differently. Not one photograph will be the same. So everybody's truth, everybody's reality is different. And that's what I love about photography. Yeah. Because, I mean, I've had brief stints in different kinds of photography, except for crime photography. <laughs> I don't think I've <laughs> ever <laughs> done that, although I would like to. You but, would? Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, so actually, with, with photography, it's a more organic approach for me because I'm a fine art. I have a fine art painting background. Yeah. So uh, for me, it's just more about looking. I mean, I can very safely say that I'm not even half as technically uh, sound as Matt over here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm totally fine with that, by the way, because you not know. Not a competition. It's, no, 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 no. What I'm trying to say no. is that, you know, for example, uh, the, the master of. Um, the decisive moment, Henri Cartier-Bresson. Mm. See, he was not technically perfect. You know, right. his, his photographs would have shakes and he would be running around or moving and taking pictures and those yeah. pictures would be blurred and people would be like, you know, what kind of photograph, bizarre photograph, how can you even call this a photograph? <laughs> so, so you know, I mean, I, I, I believe in looking at photographs all kinds of photographs mm. and uh, looking at all kinds of approaches but it's more about for me when I pick up the camera it I feel like it kind of becomes part of my body yeah. you know and then you kind of maneuver it you kind of move it around and you kind of experience whatever you're looking at um, you know very kind of organically and it's yeah. a it's a kind of a response even when I'm painting uh, I've been doing a lot of abstract painting mm. it's coming a lot from music and photography uh, but uh, I also feel like it's just about being in the moment and photography for me really is like whether it's a very commercial 
piece of work that I'm handling yeah. or I'm out on the street uh, mm. or I am uh, looking at architecture, which I like to uh, do a lot with my photographs. Yeah. You know, they don't move. <laughs> so <laughs> you can subject and also I, I also believe with the digital photography you know I mean TK you know how you if maybe you will read a, bu a book in two hours mm. but the same book Possible. I might <laughs> the same book I might I might read in a week's yeah. time you yeah. know we both will enjoy it mm. in our mm. own ways and we will both gather from it yeah. in our own ways so I think even with digital photography it you there is a possibility of slowing things down it's just about how you would kind of approach it. Hmm, that's very really interesting. And I'm yes. also sort of, Nashma, you are a multidisciplinary artist and you do, and we have been talking about how photography has sort of helped a lot of artists, yourself included, look at what you want to see in different ways. And I know that there are artists like Gerard Richter, for example, who would um, paint on his photos or use that kind of camera obscura type technique where he would sort of like, you know, project it and then paint that image and then do all sorts of things and blur things and, you know, etc. Mm. So do you feel like, how do you feel like photography has a kind of opened up or expanded your own kind of our creative vocabulary? Yeah, so first of all, Richter was actually the German painter and photographer, was yes. actually trying to look at uh, painting versus photography. I mean, okay. how accurate could a painting be to, huh. how close could it come yeah. to photography? Yeah. For example, Chuck Close would also do that. Yeah. And he would do it in a very kind of painstakingly, very mm. technical way mm. of working within the grid and making sure each facial hair is in the correct place. Uh, uh. So it was about imitating the camera. Yeah. That's a whole different other yeah. story. Yeah, because for you know, me, one part of me is like, why would you want to do that? Just leave the two things alone. <laughs> so for me, I think I before I even went to art school, I had picked up the analog camera and I was very busy taking photographs and I was uh, completely fascinated with the camera. And that's when I decided from, you know, coming from an economics and uh, law background, <laughs> that I thought that, okay, this is really not for me. And I needed good to- Good for you yeah, for realizing for me. I, that. That was, a, that was a very good decision. <laughs> I thought because- Crucial. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure that I'd be good at anything else. <laughs> so um, I actually, so the camera would always been there. And I, I, I think it was looking at light. It was yeah. looking at, you know, contrast. It mm. was looking, just looking at people even uh, or trying to understand people through the camera I think th that was uh, very much there at that time you know you're at that age and you're yeah. growing up and you're wanting to get to know people and uh, and do you feel uh, like being behind a camera especially from like Pakistani culture where you're not very where we're not generally encouraged to talk to strangers or sort of stare at people or look at them too long like these are just sort of things that we don't yeah really I mean do. what I'm what I was trying to say was that you know the camera has a very anthropological kind of yeah. approach so for example we do you know I have to I have a studio I have to maintain it so we do a lot of wedding photography <laughs> which work. is which, which is, is which, is, which is actually pretty great because I I try to also approach it through my style of photo, mm. you know mm. looking at things yeah. which is coming through the finite background yeah. so I, I also have clients where who I think I have clients who understand the kind of work that I do and it's more candid it's more uh, real and, and it's a less staged huh, yeah. and it has a narrative yeah. to it yeah. and there's like you know yeah. you can see that there's a story kind of you know unraveling yeah. there yeah but also at the same time I <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say this on live TV, <laughs> but you know, when when we're photograph, when we're at an event and we're taking pictures, sometimes it's uh, you know I I'm taking pictures, beautiful, pretty photographs of everyone, but I'm also looking at, I'm also making certain observations about yeah. our society, which yeah. is which just goes in a very separate folder <laughs> altogether. So, you know, for, for maybe for an exhibition yeah. later on, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. going to yeah. discuss Nashmiya's secret folder <laughs> during the break. Stay with us. We'll be back in a second. Hi, welcome back to the coffee table. We've been having a fantastic conversation about art and photography with Nishmiya Haroon and Matt Kushan, and it's not over yet. <laughs> so Matt, tell me, um, we've been talking about photography and how you know the sort of camera becomes like a really interesting um, tool of observation. And it also kind of helps the photographer gain ingress into situations or spaces 
where they, you know, without the camera, it might be different. So do you feel like somebody, as somebody who has sort of, is now has made a home in a very different environment, in a different space, and obviously people can tell that you are, you know, not brown. Do you feel like your photography has sort of given you that sort of, you know, that it, it's a, like a tool to connect with people? Has it, has it been like that for you? Or, or am I just decising it? <laughs> No, I mean, let, I mean, it's. I think it's fun to romanticize, definitely. But I think, um, you know, and I, and I think a lot of photographers will tell you this that definitely, you know, the camera is one of those things um, that um, is kind of an entry point into any culture. Yeah. Um, now, the person behind the camera, the thing I'm actually always most concerned about is uh, 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 what the person behind the camera is thinking and how they'll be mm. portraying uh, the culture, society, especially yeah. if they're just kind of coming in from outside. Um, so, you know, I've always had very interesting conversations on the street because of my camera. Mm. Um, I live in a neighborhood where I always walk to the Tandoor, the Sabzi Vala, and I always like, you know, grab things for the day. Yeah. And if I'm not walking with my camera, really no one no one really bothers me at all or doesn't mm. bat an eyelash, but the second I have the camera and I bring it out and I'm looking through it at something, um, then people stop. And then they start looking at what I'm looking at. And then ah. they start thinking about Seeing. Um, you know, once I actually had this guy um, who comes up to me, he kind of seemed a little bit nervous mm. um, about what I was doing. The camera was on a tripod, um, and I was just doing some, you know, making some video recordings of the street. Yeah. And he approaches me, kind of curious, and he mm. asked me, he's like, so what are you doing? And yeah. I was like, well, I'm just taking some video. You know, I'm an artist. I'm from America, but I live here in Pakistan. I've been here for like five years. Yeah. Um, and I'm just, you know, making um, a video. Yeah. He's like, so will your video be positive or negative? <laughs> and that really just kind of exploded in my mind as like, wow, you know, yeah. I'm a foreigner here in this country and this guy's very concerned about how I'm going to be portraying um, his homeland. So yeah. that kind of really made me start thinking about how other people portray um, 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 societies that they're really either not familiar with or not um, um, woven into. Um, That's so true. it's always, you know, mm. the there is the responsibility. You know, mm. Yeah. Definitely. And, you know, ethics and social responsibility is something that's always kind of also wrapped up in photography. And it's something I'm always very concerned about. Yeah. And I think, you know, like the little message to all photographers out there, you know, I think we all should kind of have a little bit of awareness about who we are in the context of where we're photographing, because that's yes. really, really important. Because, again, yeah. the photographer is the person um, kind of in control of the situation, who has the mm. power, and they have the power because they're controlling how other people see that place. Yes, and I think that applies regardless of whether one is white in a different country or whether you're in your own country taking pictures of other people. And I think that these are interesting sort of things to be thinking about. But I also have like a more Jay June question now, because when we talk about photography now in sort of digital, digital photography, we can't ignore um, Photoshop. <laughs> So, Matt, how do you, what do you think about digital alterations in photographs? So whether it's art or it's sort of representational or whatever it is, uh, do you feel like, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? I think it's wonderful. You know, uh -huh. it's like um, artists always create based on the technology that's kind of available around them. Photography is a technology that's been around for a very long time. Let's mm. say like a hundred and... 70, 80 years and counting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now we have the internet, now we have video, now we have computer programming and augmented reality and all of these different kinds of things. And it's just another technology, like mm -hmm. photography was just another technology back 100 years ago. Um, and you know, when it comes to photo manipulation, great, it's awesome, I love it, why not? Um, if you're a photojournalist, okay, maybe if you're photoshopping things, there's some, if like I think you're getting into iffy territory, especially if you're mm -hmm. trying to present truthful perspective of a place. Yeah. Um, but I think when it comes to um, it being in the hands of an artist, um, I think you know there really is no difference than maybe, um, let's say, a painter using their oil paints and mixing them just so they can um, 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 paint an image of an idea or a place mm. or a certain kind of. Yeah. So for you, it's another way of enhancing the sort of creative impulse or whatever it is that you want to say. So that's where sort of you stand on manipulation. Hmm, interesting. Now I think that that's an important distinction that it also depends on what you're trying to create mm. as well. Mm. And my sort of other question is also, because I've been thinking, thinking about how I think a great deal of 
uh, photography being taken seriously as art, for example, mm. in New York, mm. was to do with institutional support. Mm. So the Museum of Modern Art set up a photography department mm. in the 70s. And then that's where then, you know, sort of mm. you, one had the idea that, oh, well, you can actually hang, you can show photographs in museums or mm. in galleries alongside, you know, quote unquote, real art. And then that's sort of how perceptions began mm. to change. So mm. Nashmi, as somebody whose practice is based you know, in Pakistan, mm -hmm. what kind of institutional support do you think would be helpful for us or as photographers to kind of enhance or sort of, you know, develop their own practice? I think it's a lot better than since the past 15 years okay, or so. That's, since that's I, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, back in the day, I think, and even today, there are these small hubs where, you know, photographers from Lahore get together, yeah. photographers from Karachi would get together, and some of their, them are still practitioners, and mm -hmm. they move from analog to digital, or, you know, maybe they just, you know, sometimes they just archive uh, works, their own works or other people's mm. or older works. Yeah. But there used to be time, there used to be a time where us photographers used to just sit together and rip each other's works apart, you know, criticize <laughs> it, put it uh, on a, put it on a projector and yeah. look at everybody's yeah, work. That and that's the, terrifying. And no, no, but that was great because uh, that was a very kind of a personalized kind of an yeah. environment yeah. where you could look at each other's work and get some feedback on it and uh, just kind of get better and better with mm. time. Because so, I feel like art needs to grow by this sort of interaction. Absolutely. And absolutely. so do you also feel that uh, art schools teaching for art, photography has mm. also kind of, what do you, what response do you see in students? Yeah, so so uh, this is a very interesting question because uh, when I was in, un, I was an undergrad student, uh, I took photography, an elective of photography within yeah. the design department, mm. within, the, within the design department. Yeah. And, the, but now there's a course that is offered uh, within the fine arts department at the National College of Arts. Mm. And uh, I designed that course well and, I done, taught, well and I done. taught it, but that's still, <laughs> that's still an elective. But I find mm. that, you know, that a few weeks of that elective just brings in a lot of energy and the kind of perspective that I really want mm. to bring in yeah. when it comes to uh, fine artists looking at photography yeah. and I get a lot of I, I get this I get amazing feedback from students yeah. uh, who are painting or doing sculpture mm. or even miniature painting mm. we will get students from the architecture department and ah. they find it very yeah. a very useful tool and you know and only kind of helps them through their um, on programs. Mm, that, that is interesting. And it's interesting that sort of initially maybe, uh, you know, for photography being a subset of the design department, mm. it sort of gave it a more kind mm. of utilitarian aspect. That, well, yes, you can learn how absolutely. to do this yeah. so that you can, you know, be a marketer. Yeah. You know, I, something like that. I mean, the, for the first time, they understood, okay, why make this distinction? Why talk about yeah. an image as a painting or a photograph? An image is an image, you know. Yeah. So let's yeah. start looking at things, uh, you know, uh, from a different perspective. A different, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah, I like that. Matt, yeah. what do you think? Because again, um, younger younger students now coming into photography courses are obviously much more, so I'm sure, much more aware of, you know, the, the kinds of things they can do and they have been doing and, you know, with all their phones and, you know, things about light. <laughs> you can clearly tell I know not, I have no vocabulary for this. But do you feel like, is there a sort of change in students? Like, what do you feel? Like, what's the kind of temperature with photography students in your classes? I don't want to say the word, like, I, I've used this word before, but I want my students to unlearn a lot of things. And mm. I hate to use that word because I think <laughs> things that they're coming in with are very useful. And their experiences yeah. about the world are very valid. Um, but I think um, students come in with a lot of um, expectations about what, maybe self-expectations about what kind of photography they need to be producing. Ah, um, and that has okay. a lot to Exposed with, um, you know, teaching um, a photography course. I always usually like to expose my students to maybe the you know the history of photography or also um, the history of contemporary art photography um, as well. And you know, whenever I'm I'm doing research, I always make a really big effort to try to do somewhat of a balance of Eastern and Western photographers. And I hate that there's that divide, and maybe I shouldn't even say that there's that divide there, but of course there is. Um, but you know, a lot of the yeah. photographers in the photo books are definitely you know obviously. Um, 
centralized around places where there is a very uh, rich history of photography and how it exists in 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 in, in art and in, in the art community in those societies. So that's also something that I also have trouble kind of dealing with, but it's something mm. that I'm very aware with and. Yeah. I'm very conscious of. Yeah. It's also something that I kind of um, instill in my students whenever I teach them is that kind of awareness about that as well. Mm. And going back to the whole idea of kind of like the institution and the institution's role um, yeah. in photography, you know, um, as you're we talking about the MoMA and the Department of Photography and MoMA and how that played a really big role. Yeah, I think institutions are very important, you know, yeah. um, photographer, uh, a lot of the people like actually most of the directors at MoMA at like in, in, in the 70s and uh, the 50s in the 40s were photographers themselves. They were mm. curators. They were yep. um, um, actually, what's his name? Uh, Edward, Edward Seiken. He worked for Condé Nast. If you know anything about Condé Nast, they're, um, they're the, uh, the kind of the corporate mogul, uh, 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 mogul that um, runs like magazines like Vogue. Yep. So he was doing commercial <laughs> photography, and but he York was also doing town. art photography. Mm, but then mm. he was also advocating kind of like avant-garde art photography at MoMA also. Um, so photographers through our time have always kind of had a foot, their foots in a lot of places. It was interesting mm. how Nashvia brought up uh, uh, her photography course in the design department because, you know, photography is always one of those things where it kind of gravitates a lot between, you know, the commercial world, the art world, the amateur world, the, the documentary world. Um, so it's, 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 it, that's actually what keeps me going, I think, is just that fascination with photography ability just to kind of uh, change roles all the time and the people who are photographers to change roles all the time. Yeah, I, I really like the idea that it can take you in so many different directions and so many different ways of seeing and ways of thinking. And that sounds like a lot of fun. So Matt, if, huh, yeah. No, no, it's, very <laughs> that, uh, it's very interesting yeah. that Matt uh, mentioned this, but uh, I also think that there's a lot of unlearning to do when it comes to looking at photography as an art. If you had to and sort of give an example of unlearning, one thing that, that yeah, you should I was unlearn. just I was just going to tell okay. you. So for example, <laughs> as soon as my students walk in, hmm. well, they're supposed to have cameras and everything. Yeah. So the first time they actually go out to shoot, yeah. uh, we talk about the history of photography, we talk hmm. about a few technical things, but when they actually go out to take pictures, uh, uh, they, I ask them not to think too much yeah. and the best place to learn is on the street. Mm. So, uh, and sometimes what they do is even uh, even if they can't go out on the street, I ask them to just take pictures of things that interest them and not without having any preconceived notions about huh. what they're going to do or what kind of work they've already huh. been doing. Or this sort of, you feel so, like there's a compulsion yeah. to make it look So actually, I feel like, because I, I think I work like that myself. Huh. So it's, got, it's sub, you know, I mean, they start taking pictures without thinking too much and it's coming from another place huh. altogether. Huh. And what actually happens is that when they, shoot, uh, you know, we have a few of these sessions where they come back and forth into the class and go out and shoot and upload and come yeah, back again. Yeah, and yeah. so we do that over uh, two, three uh. days. And, and in, on the third or the fourth shoot, it actually starts to take shape. And that's where, and that's where it's actually a very surprising kind of an element there. Yeah. Also, they, the students they end up surprising themselves oh, I love with that. what they have. Yeah, that's, yeah, so that's the whole point of photography. You don't <laughs> you never know what you're gonna get, yeah, right? That's amazing. So, yeah, so that's that's the way I like to. Mm. I mean, without without putting too much pressure yeah. on. So I, I'd like to actually tell you something very interesting. Ah. A student of mine. This very tiny petite girl, you know, <laughs> so uh, NC, NCIH, they kind of toughen up, you know, eventually right. by fourth year, by the final yeah. year. You're like, yeah. So she was in, the, she was in <laughs> her third year or something and mm. she was from the fine art department. And uh, I said, okay, by the end of the fourth shoot, I want all of you to start thinking about what your final photo essay would look like yeah. or what do you think you're leading, what is huh. your topic leading yeah, towards? Yeah, yeah. And this one, this very petite girl, she came to me after class and she said, um, you know, miss, I'm very interested in looking at uh, uh, the male gaze, yeah. as in why are we constantly looked at or yeah. observed and yeah, what happens yeah. when we go out into yeah. the market by ourselves or, you know. And I said, are you sure you want to do this? Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a pretty challenging yeah. topic. I mean, how are you going to approach that? Have yeah. you thought about uh -huh. that? So I laid out these questions for her so yeah. she could kind of answer them through the camera. Yeah. And oh, I cannot, yeah. cannot tell you how fascinating all of her works were. In each photograph, there was a separate photo essay in each photograph. Oh, I love that. I love that sort of photography with 
as a photographer, you should be open to surprise at yes. all times. I love that. Thank you so much, Dashmiya. And thank you, Matt, for joining me today. I had such a great time talking to you guys. I thank think you. I've learned so much. Photographers, things to, things to notice, things to unlearn. <gasps> Exciting times ahead. Thank you guys for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. And we will see you next time on The Coffee Table. Bye now.